Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Gresham Technologies PLC Full Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. We'll notify you by email when these are ready for your review. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, and if you'd give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now I'd like to hand you over to CEO Ian Minocha and CFO Tom Mullen. Good afternoon to you both. Yeah, good afternoon, and thank you for hosting uh, us on this uh, call. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, delighted to take you through our um, financial results for 21, uh, and also talk to you a little bit about our strategy and uh, the outlook moving forward for the business. Um, so, yeah, the agenda's there in front of you. A, a fantastic year for us in 21. Great set of financial results, but also the strategic uh, contribution that Electra has made to the business. Uh, and I think, as you see um, through the presentation, very strong outlook. Um, we've already got 37 million uh, contracted for this financial year um, in the bag. So, you know, we're in a very strong position. So in terms of the agenda, for those of you that are less familiar with Gresham, just want to take you through who we are, what we do. Uh, talk a little bit about the marketplace that we work within, the financial services marketplace. Um, and really highlight for you the competitive differentiation that we have within our intellectual property as a company that protects our market position. Um, we'll then look at the group financial model. Uh, and you'll see how uh, the growth in our clarity business is really driving a transformation in the economics of the company. Uh, and then uh, Tom will lead that session and take us through our 21 financials. Uh, and then back to me really to talk a little bit about the strategy and, uh, and looking forward. So Gresham at a glance, who are we? What do we do? We're a software as a service solutions provider. Uh, and what we do is we provide solutions for control and automation in financial services. Uh, and the concept of control um, perhaps is unfamiliar, but if you think of a parallel in a manufacturing business, you have a control system. Um, if you're an Amazon company, you take orders, you deliver the systems that tells you what's going on and ensures that your business is running correctly. And across financial services, that concept is control. So our purpose is to enable financial institutions to digitize their operations, to have complete confidence in their data and processes in order that they can be competitive uh, and in order that they can manage their risks and, of course, their reputation. So everything we do today is founded on our Clarity platform. That's our core offering. Uh, it's an enterprise-grade software-as-a-service platform. Um, and on top of that, we have a suite of applications that really enable customers to connect, reconcile, and control any form of data, any form of process. Um, and the success of that business has got us to a point today where through um, organic growth and through acquisitions, we now have 270 customers around the world, operating uh, customers operating in 30 countries. Um, and that's really just the start for us. We have an immediate and compelling opportunity to go after um, an addressable market of 500 banks and 1,000 buy-side firms in a market in total that is a minimum of half a billion um, and a market that's growing uh, and has a number of considerable tailwinds behind it. Um, and you know, we believe there is a real opportunity for us to take 25% market share. And the reason we believe that is because you know, our track record to date um, and the tailwinds we have um, you know, really give us high degree of confidence that that prize is there to be had. So if you look at the team that we have today, a proven team, a proven strategy, um, really unique technology that I'll touch on, uh, and we've really proven that out. Um, if you look back over the last five years, the Clarity business itself has had a compound annual growth rate of 31%. Uh, and then when you add in the contribution from acquisitions, that growth rate um, becomes 
53%. We've also got a very sticky proposition uh, and a good track record of growing our customer relationships. And last year, our net ARR retention was over 100%, 106%. Um, and there's room to improve on that, I believe, moving forward. So where we are today, or at least at the end of December, is a 24 million ARR business. Uh, and as we execute on our plans, our organic and uh, ongoing M&A programs, I'm confident we can build that to a 100 million ARR business over the next five years or thereabouts. So that's really Gresham at a glance. Um, in terms of the market that we play in, you know, and the problems facing our customers, you know, our target market is in large part financial services. It's an industry that has been in massive change, um, regulatory driven change, but most importantly, technology driven change now. Um, financial services is being reimagined. Um, we all know how the disruption that's going on in the banking sector, but that's right across financial services. Um, and in large part, that's being driven by modern technology that enables firms to build different digital value chains, driven by data um, and driven by AI and automation. Um, and you know that opportunity for our customers, you know, for them to take part in that opportunity, in many ways they're being held back by their legacy operations. Um, Old systems, poor quality data, um, highly manual processes, um, processes where breaking is quite common, whether it's um, error or compliance issues. Um, and as a result, they're failing on the regulatory agenda. Um, their costs are too high. Um, and, you know, they're not managing their risk properly. And, um, you know, they have real issues from a reputational perspective. So. The marketplace in general is striving for smarter automation. And by smarter, I mean intelligent automation, not just robotic automation, um, and better control over their data and processes. And that's really what we bring to the party. Um, we bring that platform that enables control and automation um, and ultimately gives them more agility um, in their digital businesses. Uh, it ensures the integrity of those digital businesses and therefore gives them confidence um, that their business operations are running as they should do. So for us, um, you know, that market opportunity, those, those tailwinds are there. Um, we also have very clear and strong differentiation in terms of our core platform IP. In fact, it's the fact that it's a platform that gives us the differentiation. So if you look at the competitive landscape as it exists today and, and has done for um, a generation, really our competitors um, are in-house systems that are hard coded and very inflexible. They're manual processes or spreadsheets. Um, there's a small number of legacy vendor third party products, um, all largely architected and built um, in the early 90s when the market started to move strongly towards electronic trading and new systems and processes were being put in place. Uh, and those systems are highly inflexible, uh, largely batch based, uh, very costly to run. Um, and then a variety of point solutions out there. And the key differentiator for us, you know, is we're a platform play. Um, so that platform can be deployed right across an enterprise, a true controlled platform for financial services. Uh, and we've been proven across multiple use cases. It's been proven at scale and enterprise grade. Uh, and the platform has the smarts within it and rich industry functionality from those use cases that we've developed um, that really give us that strong differentiation for the customer. That means the time to value is much faster. They can get live, they can adopt the technology, they can get the business returns faster, um, and ultimately it's lower cost of ownership. So it's a really differentiated proposition that we're taking to market. And it's really behind that that we've had the success of winning new names um, and then growing our relationships with clients. What I wanted to do is try and bring that to life for you by just talking briefly about what the platform does. 
uh, and then give you a single use case um, that I hope will make things tangible. So the world that our clients live in, uh, in financial services, there is um, an incredibly complex fabric of internal and external data. Um, and the flows that are going on, um, you know, real-time flows of data that are incredibly complex. And so if you take a simple example of an investment manager needing to be connected up and sourcing data from their, you know, their custodians, their banks, um, um, sucking that data in, they need to ma manage the transaction flows, um, interpreting messages that are flying around, um, manage, uh, controlling payments, um, making sense of statements. They need to be connected up to all of their market access venues. They need to be connected up and delivering data to and receiving data from their regulatory venues. Um, and, then, and then, as I say, a myriad of internal and external applications. It's a horrendously complex uh, data fabric, um, and they need to be able to control that data, ingest it, make sense of it, match it up. And our platform gives them a range of capabilities from validating that data, um, ensuring continuous quality improvement, managing the workflows that go with resolving exceptions and breakages, um, and then key capabilities around the ability to match data, the ability to apply an institution's business rules as to how that data is treated, how it's enriched, and how it's then used to drive business decisions. That's our core platform. Uh, and what we do is we, we don't sell the tools. What we do is we sell business solutions, in other words, packages uh, of capability. Uh, and our first level of packaging is into two lines of business. One is connect, all of the connectivity, and one is control, which is the business functionality. You can see a wonderful quote there from a head of change at a global tier one bank, essentially saying um, that they had not envisaged that there was anything existing from a vendor out there in the market that had the level of data automation integrity and integrity that exists within the Clarity platform. So we've got something special here. Uh, and our go-to-market model is essentially focused on winning use cases for this technology in specific domains within specific customers. Um, and so if I give you one example, um, the customer is a, uh, a global um, fixed income broker dealer. The domain space is control of regulatory reporting. And the specific use case that I'm talking to now um, is one where they had real challenges managing the quality of their regulatory reporting to FINRA, the US uh, regulator for trade and transaction reporting, the trace reporting. Um, and the you know, the previous way of doing this, they had a third party regulatory reporting package, um, but that did not give them end to end visibility of the process. Uh, so they were late reporting and they were misreporting. Um, and since deploying the clarity um, regulatory control solution, they've got full end to end visibility. They've, they can apply their own business rules, they can validate and reconcile multiple sources of data. Um, and they get the visibility in real time of the quality of that reporting. And the net net of it is an 86% reduction in late reporting, uh, significant improvement in quality, and you know, perhaps most of all, um, you know, a happy regulator, lower operational costs, lower fines, and actually a platform they can build on. Um, and for regulatory reporting, we've received an award just recently, actually. So the key thing here is. This is one use case within the domain of regulatory reporting within the domain of one customer. Uh, and our entire business model is structured around licensing the technology for use cases and scaling that, um, that clarity business within, within the domain, within the customers and winning new customers. And that's transforming the group financials. So Tom, if I can pass to you at that point to talk about the financial model. Thanks, Ian. So yeah, to take a look at a, the, the the financial model, the, the the business model that we're we're operating here at Gresham, we are we are a high growth, high margin, recurring revenue business. We're, when we talk about that business, we're really talking about clarity now. The clarity revenues have grown to be seventy three percent of group revenues when uh, looked at on a on, on a pro forma basis, 
And those clarity revenues are driving a gross margin of 84%. That, the clarity ARR, uh, so the forward-looking ARR that, that, that Ian's mentioned earlier, uh, has grown on a five-year organic compound annual growth rate of 31%, or 53% if we include M&A into that. So strong, strong levels of, of predictability uh, from, from that recurring revenue and high margin recurring revenue business. That recurring revenue, again, as Ian alluded to earlier, has a sticky ARR net retention rate of 160, uh, sorry, 106 percent, you know, dem demonstrating that we look after our customers well. And once our customers um, are, are using our, our technology, they, they typically look to, to license more and deploy it further. Now that all, it, all of that uh, high margin um, clarity ARR and the growth in that is now driving uh, group cash EBITDA and improved margins. As a reminder, when we talk about group cash EBITDA, what we are talking about is, is EBITDA, less capitalized development exp uh, expenditure and any cash spend on, on leases that typically go to the balance sheet. And there you can see in the chart on the left hand side, continued growth in the, in the group cash EBITDA as, uh, as Clarity continues to grow. And that is after a consistent cash investment in Clarity R&D of approximately 20% of group revenues as we look to, to ensure that we, we continue to grow out our, our product set and stay ahead of our competitors. Now to move on and have a look at FY21 in particular. So I'm not going to go through each of the, the, the charts here on, on this page, but uh, I think we can see quite clearly that each of our financial metrics are heading very strongly in the right direction. And that again is just as a result of the strong clarity organic growth and the accretive acquisitions we've made to the clarity business, driving all of those positive trends ac across the business. Let's look at some of those some of those metrics in a bit more detail. To start with clarity forward looking ARR. We've seen the consi consistently strong organic growth supported by the successful acquisition strategy. Um, we looked at the five year CAGAs previously, um, and uh, pleased to say that in, in 2021, the organic growth rate of clarity remained a very strong 20 percent, uh, a, a rate that we 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 look to drive and ensure we're we're at least meeting going forward in future years. Those high levels of, of predictability are now underpinning the quality of future earnings. And the, the last point I'd like to make on, on this slide is we have the 24 million of clarity forward looking ARR, strong retention rates as we talked about. But in addition to that, we also have some forward looking ARR from our other non clarity businesses. And we equally have uh, a, a high, high value of um, non recurring contracts, largely clarity services contracts in place as at 31st of December 2021. The total of those contracts already in place before any new business, before any incremental uh, increments, renewals or, 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 um, or, or extensions of SOWs, totals 37 million of revenue that we expect for, next, for, for 2022. Uh, that, that gives us coverage of at least our 2021 revenues before winning any new business at all, giving us a high degree of confidence as we enter 2022. So to look at the clarity business as a whole, um, we've seen strong growth in the total clarity revenues, as we mentioned. Clarity revenues for 2021, totaling 25.5 million. Uh, in the chart on the left-hand side, you can see the contribution of 5.2 million in recurring revenues from the Electra business in this approximately six months post acquisition. And then if I move your attention to the to, to the right hand pies on on, on this th this slide, um, and the two I'd like to draw your attention to is is the industry segment one for a start. So of our twenty four million forward looking ARR, approximately half of it is is banking and buy side that can loosely be be attributed to capital markets. And that is that half a billion market opportunity that, that Ian alluded to in the opening few slides. So we have the vast majority, some, about three quarters of our ARR coming from that half a billion market opportunity. The remaining quarter is coming from the opportunity incremental to that capital markets uh, opportunity for us. It has a growing market space 
that's coming from uh, from retail banking, from uh, insurance broking, from energy trading, from our, our partnerships with auditors. Um, and, and that is an area that we, we expect to continue to grow. The other piece I'd just like to draw attention to on, on this slide is the regional split. Uh, we can see there 56% of our ARR now coming from North America. In terms of, uh, of the wider financial services markets and therefore opportunity for us, at least 50% of that does sit in North America. So our ARR post the Electra, Electra, Electra acquisition is now better balanced with the market opportunity. But in addition to that, and probably more importantly going forward, so, it, so is our employee base and our ability to, to, to serve our customers, given that the Electra acquisition gave us an additional 50 heads, taking our, our people on the ground in North America to approximately 60 people. So we've talked very much about clarity to date, and that is, of course, the strategic growth part of the business, the exciting part of the business. Uh, but let, let's look at how that rolls up into the group trends. So to, graph on the top right hand side is showing a consistent uh, gross margin at group level, uh, which we expect to continue going forward. But what we can see as the high margin clarity business has continued to grow is the improvement in margins, both group adjusted EBITDA margins and cash adjusted EBITDA margins continuing to improve as that high margin clarity recurring revenue starts to drop through to the bottom line. And I think it's always important to remember that that's offset by the um, reducing margins in our other non-clarity business, that whilst the revenue has remained reasonably consistent over the last five years, the margin, a gross margin has continued to decrease, which we have expected to happen um, as, uh, as the mix of that business changes. Um, we do expect the positive group trends to continue going forward. And we do have very, very strong visibility of the other non-clarity businesses 12 to 18 months out. So any, re any reductions there or, or increases for that matter, we know well in advance that that business is, is not going to drop off in any short period of time. So a quick word on, on cash and, and, and dividends. Um, cash balance year on year, relatively consistent, but obviously with the uh, significant capital raise and the acquisition of Electra, a fair bit going on under the covers there. A couple of bits that I'd like to call out. Firstly, um, and, and alluded to uh, with its close proxy, cash adjusted EBITDA, but is in the improved free cash flow, excluding the exceptional items in the year, which has improved to two and a half million from 1.7 million in the previous year. And that's, again, a trend we clearly expect to continue. Um, we can see also, uh, if we look at uh, the bar marked four um, in the graph of 0.6 million, the net of the Electra acquisition, um, the, the initial cash outflow for that acquisition being just shy of 20 million, and the capital raised net of costs being approximately 20 or just above 20, 20 million. So those two things flush through relatively cleanly, uh, cleanly in terms of the cash flow during the year. Looking forward, we, we expect to see continued growth in free cash flow, as, as already mentioned. And the two deferred consideration payments for the Electra business, um, we expect to be covered largely by, um, by, by free cash flow generated, um, generated from the, the operations of the business going forward. Um, there remains no debt in the business, but given our annual cash cycle and our annual low point in cash of the year um, being in sync with when those deferred considerations for the Electra acquisition occur, we did put a $15 million revolving cr credit facility in place should it be needed to help us help us bridge any gap that there might be at the time of those deferred consideration payments being made. We don't an anticipate using that revolving credit facility to any great degree, if at all. Ian, back over to you to talk about the growth strategy. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> yeah, so the rest of the presentation really is more forward looking, just talking a little bit about um, our strategy in the market. And, <clears throat> you know, I think over the last um, 
five years or so, we've really proven out a number of different growth plays. Um, we've proven out our ability to move cross industry. I'll come and talk about that in a second. Um, we've proven our ability to land new customers and to grow within customers. I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, we've also proven our ability to open up new country operations. Um, we've got clients in 30 countries. Um, you know, when we started this business, we had a UK company uh, in Gresham and a team in Australia. We're now a global company. Uh, we've proven our ability to um, invest in our technology, build out new capabilities that enable us to then get monetized through cross-sell um, uh, strategies, and we've proven out the M&A. Um, I want to try and say a few words on each of these um, over the next uh, five minutes or so before we then uh, look at what we need to do um, on our journey over the next six months or so. So first of all, on the cross-industry aspects, um, when we started with Clarity, um, we focused almost exclusively on capital markets. Um, that market alone um, you know, constitutes that half a billion market opportunity that I referred to on the opening slide. Um, and you know, we've already opened up that market and won very solid market share. Um, you know, we've won multiple global investment banks, multiple institutional asset managers, multiple hedge funds, uh, alternative investment managers, broker dealers, clearings, exchanges, stockbrokers, you know, we've really proven ourselves in that market um, and have got great references. Um, now, there's still another 500 uh, folks on the banking side uh, and another thousand in, if not more, uh, firms on the buy side of sufficient scale and complexity that make them a target for what we do. So there's plenty of opportunity to continue to grow capital markets. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, we have started to open up other industries. Um, so within financial services, retail banking and payments um, is a market that we started to open up in the last couple of years. Um, we've now got a couple of retail banks. We've got a couple of uh, what you would call new neo digital banks. Um, we've also opened up customers in payment services, uh, in card issuing, etc. Um, we've got multiple insurance brokers. We've got a couple of energy uh, companies. Um, and actually, in 2021, we won our first client in government and we won our first client in audit. Um, so what we have here is a proven cross-industry play, um, but we're working through in a very focused way to make sure that we optimize our resources to win deep market share in initially in capital markets, now in financial services, and then onward into other industries. Um, in terms of the second growth play around land and expand, um, you know, this is really interesting. We, you know, as we've already talked about, across the entire base last year, we've got 106% net ARR retention, which is a good number, um, but can be improved upon. Um, and, you know, that's something that we, we look at with 270 customers now, uh, you know, generally, you know, good quality, um, stable financial institutions. Um, you know, there's, there's an opportunity there to really grow that base, particularly so in our key accounts. So let me just talk around what our key accounts concept is. Um, what we, def we define a key account as a, as a customer that over a th three year period from today um, has the potential to become a half a million per annum licensed company, uh, licensed customer. Now, inevitably, they tend to be the larger financial institutions. They're often, you know, leaders in their own market. They're influencers of trend for the market, uh, and they're influencers of our product strategy in some ways as well. Um, we have six of those key accounts that have already moved beyond the half a million. Um, and actually, the slide in the top right-hand corner of the slide shows you the journey that the four larger of those six uh, companies uh, has been on. And, and what you can see there is, I mean, these are real customers, real revenues, um, that those four customers, um, you know, within um, a short period of landing, you know, we have doubled and in many cases more than doubled 
um, our revenues with those with those clients. They continue to grow. Uh, and that growth comes from a variety of different dimensions illustrated by that picture down the bottom there. You know, but we typically sign up framework agreements uh, and then we'll get consumption increase, increases in volume, new use cases. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the product cross sell, et cetera. So um, in our larger key accounts, the um, net ARR retention is much higher. Um, and, and I do believe we have the potential across our install base uh, to double revenues from existing customers, excuse me, existing customers over a three to five year period. Um, so, you know, that's a key proven growth play for us is that land and expand piece. Um, the, the other piece that is a proven growth play is our ability to drive an innovation agenda and then monetize that IP through either cross-sell of new capability um, or actually to bring those capabilities together to sell larger solutions. Um, and our R&D agenda for the next 18 months focused in some of those areas that I um, have put on that top left of the chart there. Number one, making sure that we respond to customer needs uh, and industry directions. Um, for us, it's very much about accelerating the time to value for our customers, because if we get them live quickly, they consume more of our software, so solve more problems, get a return faster, then they're going to do more with us and we'll grow that relationship. Um, we also, of course, need to stay ahead of the competition. And I think across our business, we've got a two to three le year lead on most of our primary third party competitors. Um, and of course, we'll continue to invest to make sure that our technology is modern um, because that future proof is the pr future proofs the customer. And in doing that, we future proof our own business. So I won't go into the uh, the development plans in too much detail now, but you can see some of the areas of focus in the bottom left hand corner around um, continuing to invest in our connectivity capabilities, um, including, for example, um, some of the newer Swift formats. Uh, and we're all experts in Swift nowadays, aren't we? So um, that's a key area of connectivity. Um, and, and then investing in some business innovation around the functionality. Um, so yeah, that investment in platform is key to our growth strategy as well. Um, m and and I can see that there is a question uh, on m and in the, the Q&A. So let me try and touch on, uh, on that question uh, as I go along. Um, m and has been important to us since we started the Clarity business. And over the, over the last six years, we've done three bolt-ons. Uh, and then the deal with Electra in June of last year, which was on the transformative scale. The three bolt-ons, um, you know, a million ARR or thereabouts each, um, each in our core space of financial services uh, and within financial services in the data technology area. Uh, and that's very much our focus for M&A moving forward. Um, and those acquisitions have brought us additional customers, recurring revenue, uh, and technology to supplement and grow out our platform, uh, as well as some great people into the team uh, with particular skill sets, um, notably around cloud, for example. Um, I think that bolt-on phase, whilst it's never over, uh, it's not as important to us um, as it was um, you know, when we started that six years ago. Um, so seven years ago, our ARR was just a million. 1 million sterling. So getting ARR up quickly was key uh, to being able to invest to drive the organic growth agenda. Um, so Electra is a very different um, beast. That has gone extremely well. Um, and uh, Tom, why don't you just say a few words on the transaction itself before sure. I come back and talk about where we are? Sure. Thanks, Ian. So you know, maximum purchase price of just shy of, of 39 million US dollars. Um, which was approximately three times the uh, acquired ARR of 9.2 million pounds. Um, deal structure was 75% was was paid up front, um, and we of course saw that in the in, in, in the cash flow that we we walked through a few minutes ago. Um, 12 and then with two 12 and a half percent tranches being paid, one on the first year anniversary and one on the second year anniversary of the the, the acquisition. 
and with those being based upon um, recurring revenues generated in those periods post acquisition. And we're absolutely delighted to say that the current performance indicates a very, very high likelihood of that deferred consideration being paid in paid in full. So from a pure um, financial perspective, it's, it's delivering what we wanted it to. Um, another key, um, key, key point on, on Electra since acquisition is that the organic growth rates of Electra and, and those of you who um, who, who um, joined similar presentations at the time of the acquisition, you know, will have will remember an, an Electra sort of growth rate of around the ten percent mark, sometimes slightly shy of that, sometimes slightly above. But we're looking to bring that up to um, the levels of clarity or organic growth. And we're certainly seeing an improvement towards those levels, which we're, is, is very, very good to see. Um, talked a little bit about the, the growth synergies just then. Um, but equally, there are some uh, investment synergies that um, as, a, as a larger organization, um, uh, you know, bringing together the scale of those two, two businesses, just being able to, to invest together as opposed to independent businesses. Um, we are and we have identified a number of synergies that we expect to be delivering up, upon before the end of 2022. So all in all, in uh, everything going very, very well on the uh, acquisition itself and post acquisition integration. Ian? Yeah, and I think that that integration has gone, you know, extremely, extremely well. I mean, we set out set out the plan at the time of the acquisition um, and we're bang on track in terms of that. So materially we're complete actually we have rebranded uh, we've integrated uh, the people into our organization and we now have one global organization moving forward uh, and that's not just you know the sales and marketing front end of the business but that's in services delivery support finance etc so we're now a globalized uh, single business um, and uh, you know we've onboarded um, you know, Electra's uh, core data and systems uh, and move those in large part across onto their equivalents um, that we had in place within the, the Gresham business. So, you know, we, we, we are materially there on the integration. Um, and, you know, as Tom indicates there, you know, really now working to ensure that we get the full value of, you know, the, the, the upside, um, you know, given that the hard work on integration is done. And, you know, we are seeing in the market, um, you know, some real opportunities there. So a as a reminder, really, you know, three things to take away as to why we did the Electra deal, apart from getting scale. Um, you know, number one was the US market. Um, US market is the single largest market in the world for us. We were underweight in the US. We had a team of 10 people. Uh, and whilst we had attacked that market and won customers um, you know, from our from from the UK UK end, um, we really needed to get a strong footprint into the US market to access the the market uh, opportunity. So uh, that was reason number one. Uh, number two, actually, is uh, within investment management, Electra had uh, you know focused on that market um, almost exclusively. Um, so they have some rich functionality which we can onboard onto our platform, uh, our technology excuse me, our technology platform. Um, and, you know, we are now, you know, absolutely the leading provider in the reconciliation space within investment management as a result of that. Uh, and then the third thing to say is, um, and this is really plays to the cross-sell um, agenda, you know, one of the, um, you know, real special aspects of, of, you, of Electra's um, uh, offerings has been their data business. Um, and this is a cloud-based technology solution that allows investment managers to source, i.e. collect and aggregate data from external to their organization. And, um, you know, that's a, um, it's a material part of their business. It's a fast-growing part of their business. Um, and, um, you know, their clients were US-based institutions. The data that they source was international. So, you know, there's a cross-sell opportunity for us, which we're already on to, um, to take that uh, offering global. Uh, and it's a competitive differentiation that none of our uh, traditional competitors have in their portfolio. Um, so Electra's gone really well. And, you know, for us moving forward, um, 
in order to get to that 100 million ARR goal, that aspiration, we clearly need to keep driving the organic growth at comparable levels to what we've done in the past. But we certainly can envisage, um, you know, further acquisitions, but less on the bolt-on um, kind of uh, level and more substan substantive businesses. But what I would say is, you know, these things take time. Financial technology is not cheap in the market. Um, you know, we would only do acquisitions if they were, in general, earnings accretive or could become so very rapidly. Uh, and, of course, that they're in those core markets, um, you know, namely financial services, data technologies. Um, so that's how we're looking at it. And, um, you know, we do keep a pipeline of potential relationships going. Um, and Electra is a good example where, you know, as a competitor in our space, we've been tracking them for some years um, before the time was right for their founder ownership to, to, to you know, come to market. Um, so that's, you know, our, our third dimension of growth really on the M&A side. Um, so as I said, just to recap on the growth, um, cross industry, building out internationally, land and expand, M&A, cross sell, upsell on the product side. Um, and, but internationally, the focus is very strongly in the US market. Now, as we grow the business, um, you know, we're, we're building a great company here. Um, and, you know, four acquisitions on, you know, these factors become even more important, um, and particularly in today's market where there's competition for talent. So I'm, you know, delighted that, um, you know, we've got, I think, a, you know, a very special culture within the business. It's very growth orientated, but it's very collaborative. Um, and, uh, you know, we operate as a single global company, global values, global ways of working. Um, and, um, you know, I think we've got a highly engaged and very talented team. Uh, each year, we, uh, we do a health check. Um, we have an annual employee engagement survey. Um, the same 58 questions every year in 14 categories. Uh, and we consolidate those results and, and we... Uh, we obviously track and we build action plans off what we're hearing from our team. Um, and, and those scores have improved year on year. And, uh, you know, another very strong year at the end of 21 when we did the survey. Um, and you can see just a couple of the categories there. In, in the category of teamwork, you know, really remarkable score of 86%. Um, you know, so it's very much uh, the culture in our business is to make sure that we are doing absolutely everything as a team to play to our strengths um, and 82 percent on on the customer score so i think that gives you a sense of the quality of the business we're building above and beyond uh, the numbers um, and you know scaling up responsibly uh, is obviously incredibly important um, so tom maybe um, a little wrap up on on that point sure thanks ian and to talk about scaling up responsibly something that's always has been incredibly important to us and you know as it's you know, getting more prominence uh globally um both in the business world and and outside that is something that, that we're placing more focus on as uh, as well so towards the back end of 2021 we completed a, a third party ed, expert led strategic review of our esg considerations and environment um and, and that included you know perception audits of, of of employees shareholders customers and other stakeholders around the business that has resulted in uh, a long-term uh, direction and framework uh being developed under a, a three pillar strategy three pillar strategy being our customers our world and, and our people um and we look very much looking forward to actually being able to report some um, measurable targets and measurable results against those targets in future years as we further develop that strategy and plan. Um, last but certainly not least on, on, on this slide, um, we, we, we have taken very swift, swift action in order to meet our responsibilities in relation to the Ukraine crisis. Uh, those responsibilities both being our, our legal obligations but, but also and, and arguably to a greater degree, our moral obligations to, to, to our people and, and our customers and, and the world. Um, in terms of direct exposure, 
um, we have very, very limited direct exposure, um, less than 200,000 of ARR that, uh, that may be, 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 be impacted by, by sanctions. Um, we have no software development activities in, in Eastern Europe. And um, our employees who do have uh, direct exposure to, to, to the region, um, we are providing all the appropriate support to. So. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So I guess just to wrap up and talk a little bit about, you know, top of mind for us over the coming months, um, you know, as we've already described, we go into um, FY22 with 37 million under contract. Um, and a very high proportion of that is is recurring revenue on longer term contracts. So it is a good base to work from. Um, and, uh, you know, that, but clearly we need to keep driving that growth agenda. So uh, top of mind for us is is now having completed in large part the integration of Electros to drive those synergies that Tom was talking about, uh, some on the cost side, but most notably on the revenue side. Uh, ensuring uh, that we keep our innovation agenda on track. Um, and you know that opens up the cross-sell uh, opportunity for us, um, and we are systematically looking at cross-sell. So, you know, we've got a very good view of our entire customer base, 270 customers. Um, you know, what do they have from us? Um, you know, where's the cross-sell upsell opportunity? And you know, working through that one on a programmatic basis. Um, in terms of moving the dial. Um, you know, then actually, as you'll have seen from the uh, the slides that we showed earlier, key accounts has the opportunity to move the dial for us. Um, and I think, um, you know, that is, um, you know, if you if you think about those institutions being in large part the, the largest global financial institutions, whether they're, you know, on the banking side or uh, on the buy side, the investment management community, a lot of them have. Uh, headquarters or significant operations in the US. So we're, we are investing further in the US above and beyond uh, the, uh, the team that we brought into the business with Electra. Um, we've just uh, increased the sales headcount over there. Uh, one new joiner last week, in fact. Um, we're hiring for uh, marketing resources into the local area. Um, and we're hiring for inside sales and a num number of other areas. In, in fact, I would say, moving forward for the rest of this year, um, our investment plan is weighted um, you know, very significantly towards sales and marketing investment, um, you know, to really build out our, um, our reach um, and our distribution. And around distribution, I think we can do more with partners. Um, you know, we do have a number of third parties that white label our software as solutions to their customers. That includes uh, our control offerings and the data service business and the connect offerings. Um, we have a number of partners that we work with uh, to originate deals where they will take on implementation work uh, and we can scale that up as well. So partners will become increasingly important to us moving forward. Um, and then, yeah, it, it is very much about continuing to grow the key account relationships that we have. And, you know, as I said, if you look across that install base of 270 customers, you know, if we can double that revenue over the next three to five years from the install base alone, that takes us a very long way towards our, you know, our, our goals. So, yeah, a lot of good momentum in the business. Fantastic 2021 in terms of all the numbers, but also strategically really good progress. Uh, strong recurring revenue, good visibility, good momentum, and I think a clear plan. So at that point, why don't I take a break and let's just see if there's any further questions coming Ian, in. Ian, Tom, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you for your presentation this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Ian, Tom, if I could please ask you just to open up that Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen. And as you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And thank you to all those investors for submitting their questions. If I could please ask you to read out the questions and give a response where it's appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from at the end. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. So um, we, we've, we've actually tried to address some of the questions as we've gone along. So, But let me go through 
Um, so there was one around M&A, um, and uh, you mentioned in the results that you're seeking further enhanced earnings enhancing acquisitions, which add adjacent technology. Can you give us an idea of what you would consider and what size of transaction you would consider? And um, I, I guess just to kind of summarize on that one, um, we would only really consider um, good quality businesses with recurring revenue, i.e. a subscription business model or a model we can turn to subscription um, that's earnings enhancing or can be earnings enhancing near term uh, and has the right industrial synergies, namely it's into financial services uh, and it's in the data technologies space. Um, and having done four acquisitions of different scales, um, I think the team can, uh, can certainly uh, see the opportunity for further transformative scale acquisitions. Um, you know, in our market cap of over 100 million, um, you know, certainly we would be uh, up for considering if the right opportunity came along, um, you know, something in and around the, the 50% of market cap. So that's kind of the, the area that we would feel most comfortable. But what I would say is, you know, opportunities don't come along very often. Um, do you want to maybe take the next couple of questions, Tom? Sure, sure. So uh, next question there, you know, what key milestones um, are we uh, on the lookout for in 2022 and what's missing from our business to achieve the target of 100 million ARR? I think we've actually largely covered that from a, an M&A pers perspective. Clearly, we are looking to ensure that the organic growth agenda um, is, is still delivered upon. We want to ensure that that organic clarity ARR um, of at least 20% per annum is still achieved year on year, year out. Because at the end of the uh, at the end of the day, if the appropriate acquisition doesn't um, doesn't present itself, then uh, you know by growing 20% plus an hour per annum, we will still have uh, a very sizable uh, cash generative business by uh, within the next three to five years. Um, do we have any exposure to Russia or the U Ukraine? Um, we, I think we've already covered that one, so I won't um, won't dwell on that that one again. And then also from a global perspective, do you see any country or region delivering greater growth uh, for the company? And if so, why? Again, I think we've probably covered this one, but the North American market for us is by far the biggest, uh, has, has the biggest, or is the biggest market and therefore has the biggest potential. Um, Electra gave us some significant additional scale in there, but we're still continuing to invest on um, on uh, take, you know, taking some of the uh, market opportunity that's available to us there. Yeah, and I think on on that point, I mean, where we place our direct salespeople is is into the the largest you know financial hubs in the world. So we've got you know a team out of New York, we've got a team in London, we've got a team actually in Luxembourg, Singapore, and um, in Sydney and Australia. Um, but actually, those those teams you know service cu customers in thirty countries around the world, um, and you know we're seeing. Um, you know, pipeline growth in Asia, we're seeing it as Tom's indicated in the US, in Western Europe. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do think for us, you know, that in terms of that question about asking, you know, what, what should we look out for in terms of announcements to know that we're on track? You know, the, the key accounts is, is probably the key thing to, to look out for, because, um, as I said, that key account deals can move the needle. Um, and you know those large, uh, you know larger global institutions do tend to be, uh, you know, largely operating out of the U.S. or other key financial centres like the U.K. Um, another question has just popped up actually in terms of challenges that we're seeing in terms of the workforce attrition uh, and in terms of uh, upward salary pressure. Uh, it's a very appropriate um, question and. Um, you know, I did touch a little bit on this um, in in talking about uh, the team. Um, so, uh, you know, our um, employee turnover uh, last year in twenty one and twenty twenty was was similar, if not slightly lower. In fact, um, you know, for COVID reasons, uh, is you know in and around that ten percent for a tech company. That's very low. Um, and, um, you know, we're very proud of that. I think we look after our people very well. Uh, we create the right environment. But we also know that, 
Um, you know, talented people are in demand in the market. Um, we need to make sure that we offer a competitive and fair package. Uh, and we also are acutely conscious that, you know, um, cost of living and inflation is eating away, you know, at salaries for, um, you know, many people. So um, this year in particular, we've given a lot of focus around this. Um, and, um, you know, you will see, of course, in our report that we've reported our um, expectations for, um, you know, the aggregate uh, salary increase of being 5% across the entirety of the business um, for 22. Um, but we've chosen to weight that to, um, uh, to it at the individual level uh, to certain segments, um, and most notably to some of our um, more junior members of our team, um, you know, lower and mid salaries, um, and of course, in some of those key functions as well, uh, in, in order that we can get the balance right. Uh, good. So I can't see any further questions. Um, final couple of minutes, if there are any. Ian, Tom, thank you very much for addressing all of those questions that have come through from investors this afternoon. Of course, if there are any further questions that are submitted, we will make them available to you immediately after this presentation. And ladies and gentlemen, all of the responses will be published on the Investor Meet Company platform and we'll notify you by email when these are ready for your review. Uh, Ian, Tom, perhaps before redirecting investors provide, to provide you with their thoughts and expectations, which I know is particularly important to the company, if I could please ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for hosting. Um, a good session. I hope everyone's found it um, really interesting and worthwhile. I, I guess to wrap up, um, you know, 21 on all of the KPIs that Tom showed, uh, you know, really, really strong results. Um, more importantly, I think, you know, strategic progress with the Electra acquisition, which really gives us a strong platform to sustain the growth. Um, we go into the year with exceptionally high levels of visibility, you know, 37 million. Um, already under contract. There's very good momentum in the business um, and we've got tailwinds in our space, uh, in financial markets, in data, in digital transformation. Um, and uh, you know that, that gives us a lot of confidence in 22 as well, in spite of a very uncertain uh, macro uh, situation out there. So we feel good about things and, and hope you do in terms of Gresham business as well. Ian, Tom, that's perfect. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to update investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure it'll be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Gresham Technologies PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session and good afternoon to you all.